Welcome to the Untold Civil War. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for coming back onto the show. I am with uh, Daryl Smith and Derek Lindo uh, to discuss the Western theater. So thank you very much for coming back on. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having us. So I want to just open it up with a one kind of basic question here, and we'll see how far of a rabbit hole we'll get down with this one. But when people mention the Western theater, for those who might not know, what does that encompass when we talk about the Civil War? Well, uh, this is actually something me and Daryl have talked about on the on the blog. Uh, I think Daryl actually made a post about this on the blog, and then we've talked about it quite a bit on the Facebook group too. But I think just for a, a simplified explanation for it, I think most people can recognize that it's the area of the war that's between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. And, um, you know, so you've, you've got a huge, massive area of the war. And it's, um, you know, several states, several major rivers, uh, several armies that are in this area. And so uh, for, for, you know, the very simplified answer to what the Western theater is, I think that's probably what most people can uh, agree on. Yeah, I, I would concur that it did spark some discussion. It's interesting to get uh, different perspectives from people because they would say, well, it's where Western armies fought. Well, then you go into, into the Carolinas. So is the Carolinas a Western theater? Uh, you know, it, it, so it's kind of hard to, to really nail that down and get like a consensus. I mean, conversely, if you use that argument, then technically the 11th Corps and the 12th Corps, when they come out West, does that become now the Eastern theater around Chattanooga? Well, of course it doesn't. Um, but I, I agree with Derek, uh, the, the general geographic area would be uh, between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River. Now, the, the blog and website, we delve into Trans-Mississippi stuff, too, because there's not a lot of people doing that. But um, we, we definitely focus on the Western theater. Right. Right. That one makes sense. I mean, then, uh, what was it, 1862 uh, with the Secessionville uh, and campaign down in South Carolina, that expedition over there? That, would that be considered the Western theater then just because it's in South Carolina? I, I don't think so, but yeah, I don't right. think so either. <laughs> right. Okay. So we're, we're now we've narrowed it down to a, a geographic location, right? Um, now I, I sometimes feel like the Western theater often gets forgotten or left out. This is why we call it the untold civil war, right? Which is unjustly. So um, one thing that I say is a big selling point for studying the Eastern theater is I think there's a lot of colorful commanders and colorful, colorful units that serve in the Eastern theater. Do we see the same in the Western theater? Oh yeah. Uh, you know, and that's one of the reasons why we, we started this blog almost a year ago, uh, July of last year is when we officially launched it. And, you know, that was, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to, you know, there are so many stories in the Western theater uh, there are so many important events that occur in the Western theater. And, you know, this is where we think uh, war was actually won or lost, depending on, you know, your side there. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's loaded with stuff like that. And so, you know, as we're, as we've been trying to grow this blog uh, over the last year, and, you know, hopefully into the future a lot more too, uh, we're, we want to bring forth a lot more of those interesting stories and those uh, interesting characters on both sides, because there, there are plenty of them. So, I mean, just for me personally, um, you know, for uh, those interesting regiments, um, this isn't really a regiment, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of interesting brigades, I would say, are out in the West, too. Um, you know, for me, being from Kentucky, you know, the Orphan Brigade, you know, that's a, uh, they're, they're a special bunch to me. But then you also see a lot of those, um, you know, great Kentucky units, and I'm just speaking for just Kentucky here, but uh, you, you got them from all the states, and you know, there's all kinds of awesome, amazing regiments. Um, you know, 17th Kentucky uh, Federal is, you know, that's one of my favorite Union regiments uh, to, to study about because, I mean, they've got their interesting story, their own interesting commanders. And, uh, and I'm sure Daryl can probably name off quite a few of his favorites, too. But, yeah, there, I mean, there are tons of stories and people like that out there. Yeah, absolutely. You talk about colorful, colorful um, characters as well. I mean, come on, we got Braxton Bragg and Nathan Bedford Forrest and John Morgan and Van Dorn. And I mean, that's just Confederate side. And of course, Grant gets a start, I guess, technically in the Trans-Mississippi, but transcends pretty quickly into the Western theater. Uh, we have our own version of a guy named George B. McClellan and, and Don Carlos Buell, uh, an excellent organizer, probably should have been the quartermaster of the West, maybe not a field commander. Um, you have conflicts in command, just like you do in the, in the East, but... I think they're exasper exacerbated in the West 
Um, because in the East, it seems like this guy named Robert E. Lee could fire people he didn't like. Yeah. And they oftentimes would wind up under Braxton Bragg. So it's it was kind of interesting where these, well, I hate to say rejects, where some of these commanders wind up going. Uh, there are, again, tons of interesting units. Uh, the 35th Indiana being the first Irish Indiana regiment uh, here in Cincinnati. Of course, we've got the 9th Ohio and the 10th Ohio being predominantly German for the former and predominantly Irish for the latter. Um, just brigades, uh, I will counter with the, uh, the, the Missouri Brigade on the Confederate side as well, Cockrell's Brigade. Uh, a little shout out to my Missouri friends out there. But I would also counter with some of these really hardcore Union Brigades. Um, Hazen's Brigade is a perfect example, just hard fighters throughout the war. Parker's Brigade at the Battle of Chickamauga. Um, of course, I can't forget Ferdinand Vanders Vanderveer's Brigade there as well. And so there's still that colorful um, pageantry. Um, a lot of these units did start off with kind of funky looking uniforms early in the war, um, but they standardized into that traditional Western garb um, pretty early on. I mean, they were more practical. A lot of these guys were more rural than urban. Um, so they took, uh, took it upon themselves, I think, to be more practical in combat uh, as opposed to uh, paper collar soldiers. Yeah, with the, you know, and then I was, that got me thinking about some of the, the other colorful characters too. Uh, on the Union side, you got to think about, you know, John McClernand and, and uh, Black Jack Logan. I mean, those two guys, uh, you know, two Illinois Democrats that were, you know, essential in keeping at least Southern Illinois loyal to the Union. And, you know, just the, the way that, you know, they both come from that same politician background, but the way they go throughout the war, they kind of divert into, you know, different, uh, different paths with McClernand ends up, he ends up getting canned, uh, you know, during the Vicksburg campaign. And while Logan, you know, he rises to, you know, at superstar level, you know, briefly commands the army of the Tennessee for a bit after uh, McPherson gets killed. But, um, you know, he's, it's, you look at these two guys and, you know, people like to, you know, dogpile on the political commanders quite a bit, but, you know, these are two guys that, they actually do a really good job and they've got some very interesting personalities um, even though McClernand doesn't really quite get to get the finish to the war that he definitely would have liked. Well, don't they say, I mean, I know like early in the war with uh, when you look at Hooker, it wasn't there a sort of an understanding that the West had a lot of fighters. There was like a lot more fighting culture, tenacity in the West. Is that true? Uh, you know, I, I think that's something that you can look at that in a lot of Eastern units too, and a lot of Eastern commanders. And I, I think that's not really something that's just in the East or just in the West, or one is more predominant than the other. I, I think you've got your good mix of both. Um, you know, any battle you look at, you're going to find some of those, you know, East or West, you're, you're going to find those just tough fighters that aren't going to give an inch, or, you know, those guys that just aren't going to be stopped. And uh, so, I mean, you can you can definitely find those guys in the West. Um, but, you know, I, I don't really think there's, um, you know, more in the West or anything like that. But I think, uh, you know, you're always going to find them out there. I think mm -hmm. part of their background of being, I, I already alluded to it too, you know, being rural guys, uh, I think they're a little more inured to hardships. So I don't disagree with what Derek is saying. You know, I could, you can go through the orders of battle in the Eastern theater easily and find excellent units and excellent, excellent fighters. Um, but, you know, the, the Confederate armies in the West, you know, when they when they, when they went up against Yankee boys uh, from, from Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Michigan, you know, those guys didn't run as much or, again, that's a simplification. But, you know, they would hang around. Uh, they would fight. They would stand. Um, they would tough. They were tough. They would, you know, they could march, um, you know, the equivalent of Jackson's foot cavalry attack. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think part of it is, there is a little bit of a difference. There's, there are urban centers, obviously, in the West, um, but uh, I, I think because they are more, or, uh, more rural type uh, backgrounds, I think that you know more horseback riding, more familiarity with guns. And again, it happens in the East. I just think it might be a little more common in the West. Yeah, well, I would agree with that too. Yeah, I mean, if you think about you know Sherman, you know when he breaks off from Atlanta. And goes on, you know, that epic campaign. When those guys come out, you know, at the end of the war, uh, going through D.C., you know, I, I think there is a major difference between the Eastern armies marching down, uh, down through uh, Washington D.C. and 
uh, Sherman's army uh, going through uh, downtown DC. Big difference in the way those guys looked. And yeah, I think maybe the way, you know, the attitudes that they had too. Those guys knew, you know, coming out of, you know, the Carolinas, just what they had been through, you know, breaking away from their supply lines. Um, I, I don't think that happened a lot in the East, you know, where guys just cut away and, uh, you know, you're really going to have to take advantage of that foraging. I, I mean, I might be wrong on that, but I just, I can't think of a really an example where you have a major army in the East doing that for an extended period of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, going back to that original question about colorful units, one of the big reasons I like the East uh, was because they have the 79th New York Highlanders. Now I know they do go out West at some point, uh, but the West has their own Highlanders in like the 12th Illinois, right? So yeah, you got, yeah, you got uh, MacArthur uh, from Illinois. He's got uh, you know his his Highlanders that you know are at Fort Donaldson and at Shiloh, and yeah, so yeah, you you get a lot of these ethnic regiments out in the out in the West too, which is always interesting to study. Absolutely, yeah, concur completely. Um, they may not be as colorful as the, as I alluded to as the war progresses. Um, but they start out pretty colorful. You've got your militia uniforms in gray. You've got guys wearing green kepis out here as well. Uh, 35th of Indiana being a perfect example of that. Um, you, you have your colorful units. Um, like I said, they just get, I think they get more practical sooner, um, which is unfortunate. I mean, we love the colorful uniforms <laughs> as well. Um, but I think they become more practical in, in their field dress. Yeah, that, that actually reminds me, um, one of the uh, Louisiana regiments at Shiloh, you know, they show up wearing their brand new blue uniforms and then they start getting shot in the back from, you know, their own side and decide pretty quickly that uh, they're going to turn those jackets inside out and it's just going to be white. Uh, but I think they would rather um, take their chances being shot by the enemy than being shot by their own men. So, you know, that, that's just another example with, with this, you know, such a big variety, uh, you know, in, in unit personalities. And, and now moving on, I think now it's time to ruffle some feathers here. I think we covered some, some nice things over here, but I think it's time to ruffle some fe feathers. Now, I often hear this all the time uh, from people who've studied the Civil War, uh, you know, experts, movie fans. Uh, <laughs> um, but I hear a lot of time that Gettysburg is the turning point of the Civil War. What would you guys say to that? Well, just judging by my <laughs> visit there two days ago, uh something was not wanting me to be at Gettysburg with you know bus issues I got stung by some insect I don't know what it was twice <laughs> got poison ivy it poured poured rain on me the whole time so you, you know Gettysburg at the moment is a little soured in my mind but um you know we I think that's something me and Daryl would definitely uh or Daryl and I would definitely disagree with uh you know Gettysburg being you know the the thing that wins um for me, you know, I mean, I think, you know, Vicksburg is where it's at, but uh, if you're really wanting to look at, you know, where did the door get kicked open at, um, you know, I think you really got to take a good look at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, you know, not the biggest battles in the world, uh, you know, fairly early on, you know, February 1862, but when you think about how important those two events were, you know, you think about, uh, you know, Albert Sidney Johnston's Kentucky line, that is where they found the crack in the line, they swung the door open, and after that, I mean, it was just plunging into the south, and, uh, you know, Nashville falls, They're, they get down to, you know, right on the border of Mississippi, Union Navy can go all the way down to Alabama, basically unopposed, um, you know, Memphis is going to fall shortly after that, so, um, you know, it's, um, I, I think we got to look at a lot of these other campaigns, too, um, you know, but, you know, I think a lot of it does come down to Vicksburg. Eventually that, you know, that was, I guess, like, you know, what Lincoln said, it was the key. Uh, but um, yeah, that's that's just kind of where my thoughts are at. Um, I don't want to speak for Daryl, so you know, I'll let him uh, give you his opinion there too. Oh, Derek is so full of crap. Of course it's <laughs> Gettysburg. Because what happens after Gettysburg? They go back after, they go back to fighting over that same 90 miles they've been fighting over for the first two years. <laughs> come on, it has to be a turning point. Don't get me wrong. I love Gettysburg. At one point, I probably had 100 different books on Gettysburg. I, I call it the gateway drug into the Civil War. You want to get somebody hooked into the Civil War, you take them to Gettysburg and you show them all the iconic monuments, the sweeping views. It's it's beautiful place. It's wonderful. Um, but it, I, I don't want to use the term overblown, but I am going to use the term overblown. And it is where Lee is turned back. And I think that 
is what becomes extremely important. Of course, you can say the same thing in, in Tatum the year before, but it is where Lee is turned back. So that's, I think, you know, in the East, that's where these Eastern veterans can start to hang their cuppies and their forage caps on, right? They can start to say, hey, we won at Gettysburg. The war continues to be a meat grinder, as I already alluded to, over fighting over those same 90 miles uh, for the next two years. But I think that's why it's so, it resonates so strongly in the East. Uh, in the West, I, I agree with Derek. There are, I think there are turning points are so hard to pinpoint in the Civil War because there's so many connected points that have their own small impact. Fort Henry is definitely one of those. Uh, Professor Tim Smith's excellent book on that, on that campaign blows that door wide open for us as historians and, and as readers um, because the impact of where, as Derek mentioned, the Union Navy can now get to. Um, Nashville will fall uh, just a few days after Donaldson, uh, but Albert Sidney Johnston has already decided he's pulling out a bowling green before Fort Donaldson falls. That's the import of Fort Henry. Um, people will call Perryville the turning point of the war. I don't know if it is or isn't, and people will give Bragg a hard time about the whole Kentucky campaign, but the Kentucky campaign keeps Chattanooga from falling for a full year. And I think people don't realize that. Don Carlos Buell had been maneuvering across southern or northern Alabama. They were 30, 25, 30 miles from Chattanooga when the um, Kentucky campaign launches uh, and forces that Union Army to retreat back into Kentucky. So, and, it, and again, it doesn't fall until September of the following year. So there's all these different points, I think, that we can put together in peace and say, hey, that's an important point. But I don't, I don't agree either that Gettysburg was a turning point of the Civil War. I think it's an important morale point of the Civil War. It, it is still sort of the uh, Civil War buff Disneyland, I think, uh, Disney World. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I can attest to that. You know, when I was there the other day, just how crowded the place is. Right. Uh, you, you know, I mean, you know, I don't want people to ever get the wrong idea that, you know, just because we have this Western theater site that, and we, we hate the West Eastern theater. That's, you know, that's not it at all. I mean, I love anything I get my hands on Civil War related. I've just, you know, chosen to focus on, you know, this area because uh, it's, it's my backyard. I guess you could say, you know, from Kentucky, you know, so it's, you know, I'm Western theater all the way. There's not a lot of Kentuckians out East. So, you know, trying to, you know, research all that. I've focused on the West. So, but I, I do love Gettysburg. You know, I don't want to get you hate emails or anything like that. I, I do love going there. <laughs> Except when you're stung. And get poison ivy, but beyond yeah, that, and the bus almost falls up. But you know, other than that, you know. <laughs> well, why do you think uh, that the uh, Western theater often gets sort of forgotten? I mean, you know, here we are. We just talked about all these major, you know, multiple um, arguments for where the turning point could have been in the Western theater. Uh, we've talked about how the war essentially could. You could argue that it was won in the Western theater. Why does it get forgotten? You know, I, just in my opinion, I think, you know, being so close to the the two capitals, I, I think that is you know a, a big reason. And plus, you know, the, the major population centers that are on the eastern seaboard. I mean, that's when, when people are wanting to read the news about what their families or what their family members are doing in the war. Most of them, I would venture to say, are going to be in the eastern theater. And so you, know, you got, you know, that huge population. You got the, the politicians on both sides just you know, glued and fixed to what's going on right there in front of them while on the Confederate side at least is seemingly neglecting what's going on out West. Um, so that, that's just, that's just me though. So uh, Daryl, what do you think? Um, I, I think it's a combination. I, I love that. You're absolutely right. The capitals being so close to each other, um, uh, newspapers, development, population centers of the, of the seventh lar seven largest cities in the United States only Cincinnati and New Orleans are on this side of the country. The other five, of course, are in the Eastern Theater. Uh, so you have um, probably a different take just from how news is getting out, how news is getting spread. Um, uh, and the closeness of the war in the Eastern Theater. I mean, today, as we're all aware, you can't travel two miles without hitting some skirmish site in the Eastern Theater, which is awesome. Out here, it's far more spread. Um, and out here, I think the commanders, they're dealing with a lot more. They're dealing with much, much longer logistical supply lines, um, even though they have rivers that in some cases are favorable and some railroads, 
they are still dealing with hundreds of miles of rail lines. I mean, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad is a major striking point for Confederate Raiders almost throughout the entire war. Um, and it's a tenuous line that will come down and support armies moving towards Nashville, Chattanooga, Atlanta, et cetera. So I, I think you, when you add in the logistical nightmare that some of these commanders have to deal with, you, Derek talked about uh, Sherman breaking free. Well, Grant makes that same decision uh, in the Vicksburg campaign. He breaks free of a supply line and starts to live off the land as he's moving inland once they cross the Mississippi River. You know, these are gutsy moves, uh, could lead to disaster, but these are gutsy moves. Um, and, and so they've, you know, later in the war, they learned to live off, off the land instead of the supply routes. But uh, I, I think initially in the first part of the war, uh, you know, the Western theater becomes so important. It's vast, it's huge. Uh, Derek mentioned that, you know, kind of the Confederates, I mean, they ignore it, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, Jefferson Davis may appoint Albert Sidney Johnston as overall commander of department number two, but then doesn't really do a whole lot to support Johnston and his efforts uh, in terms of troops, in terms of materials, in terms of munitions, whatever the case may be. And I, I think for the Confederates, it's it's a definitely a tough road to hope. So there's no doubt about it, because uh, based on the Confederate strategy to defend all points as opposed to defend smart points, um, it makes it very difficult for the Confederacy on this particular side. And luckily, you know, they have some some timid um, Union commanders that are facing them initially, at least initially in the war, until Grant rises and you start to get Rosecrans in place and those kinds of guys. Um, so I, th I think, you know, it's it's not as well known because, you know, if you go to Gettysburg, again, we use that as our, you know, our, our symbol, our beacon, right? You can literally buy a book on any topic at Gettysburg. I swear there's probably a book on the types of horse poop at Gettysburg somewhere. <laughs> it's got to be. Yeah. And it's cool. It's great. It's awesome. But you don't get that amount of detail and interest. Uh, it, it's it's increasing over the last few years. You have wonderful authors like David Powell. I've already alluded to Tim Smith, who are really delving in and making these massive multi-volumes. You know, we got three volumes on Chickamauga. We've got four volumes coming out on Atlanta, hopefully over before I die in my lifetime. Um, Tim Smith is writing five, 10, 600 volumes on Vicksburg. Another one was just released. And so uh, those, those books are starting to come out, but those are major campaign studies, major tactical studies. Um, what we're finally also starting to see, like at Chickamauga, Robert Carter is doing like just walking guides, right? We, we don't really have that in the West. Where Gettysburg, you've got a walking guide on East Cemetery Hill, you've got one on Devil's Den, you've got one on First Day. You've got, I mean, so I think those things are finally starting to happen a little bit, and I think the interest will continue to grow. Um, but, but it, you know, geographics or uh, geography and population, I think, is is probably why it is still the Eastern Theater is is looked at um, with a lot more reverence. I guess uh, that's I guess that's the little term I want to use. So. And absolutely. And I think this blog is doing a great job of uh, getting the word out as well. Can we talk about how that uh, started? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I, I guess it was about uh, a year and a half ago. I just really, well, actually, I need to back up further than that. Um, I'm a, I'm actually pretty recent to Facebook within the last few years. And so I remember when I got on there, uh, you know, I was doing all these, all the civil war groups I could find. And I noticed that there really wasn't something that encompassed the entire Western theater. I was finding some things you know, on, on individual battles, which you know I love following those groups. So if you are on Facebook, make sure you're following the Shiloh discussion board group. Make sure you're following the, the Chickamauga Chattanooga discussion board. I mean, there's, there, there are some fantastic ones out there. And, but I wanted something that, you know, just covered the Western theater. And I, I just, I wasn't finding one anywhere. Uh, at least when I typed it in, you know, in search, no, nothing was coming up. So like, well, I'll just, I'll just make one. And so I made made a group, and I think the first follower on there was my mom, and uh, so yeah, I got got that support right away. Uh, and then yeah, it's kind of started to grow, and, uh, and you know, eventually we had you know a couple thousand people uh, in the group, and yeah, you know, I started noticing on on some other pages and uh, just you know people's comments that you know please talk about the Western Theater, please talk about this battle or or this battle, you know, because it was all the stuff coming out. It, it seemed like to always be about the East and. You know, the people who are out here in the West, uh, you know, that's this is where their ancestors fought. This is where you know the battlefields that are close to them. This is where they're putting their month, their preservation dollars into are these battlefields out here, and you know they they want to see some of that same connection. 
And I just kind of noticed that. And so I thought, you know, maybe we should just make our own a little blog uh, website that focuses just on Western theater events and people, and battles. And so I reached out to, to Daryl and um, uh, somehow convinced him to, to join uh, me in this. And uh, so la about a year ago, last July, we, uh, we officially launched our, our site and um, we, we've been putting out at least a couple uh, blog posts a week since then and got several more lined up in the queue here. So, you know, we, um, we think we're being pretty successful in that so far. Uh, you know, we're, we're just trying to bring more attention to the Western theater, uh, more awareness to it, um, you know, because there's, there are a lot of endangered sites out in the West. And, you know, one of the other things we're also trying to do too is, you know, bring attention to that. Anytime American Battlefield Trust is, has a campaign for something in the Western theater, you know, we're plastering all over that Facebook group. Because, um, you know, we, we want people to see that. We want people to contribute to that. And, uh, you know, and then with the uh, same thing with the blog, you know, anytime there are Western theater events that are going on or tours, you know, we try to put that up uh, on the site. We just, someone wants to reach out and say, hey, this is what's going on. Then, you know, we'll, we'll put it up on there. Um, so, you know, we're in, another thing that we started to do too uh, this year was uh, starting to do uh, Western theater focused tours. So last April, uh, we did our first one uh, out at uh, Mumfordville uh, Battlefield part of the Kentucky campaign, and then the Tebbs Bend uh, Kentucky Battlefield, part of uh, Mr. John Morgan's uh, interesting 1863 uh, raid, part of that. And uh, so, you know, we, we are trying to expose people to some battlefields that they may have never even thought of. And, uh, and so we're going to continue that. Um, and then at the end of July, early August, we've got one with um, that Daryl and I are hosting out at uh, Richmond, uh, Kentucky. Uh, the, the eastern part of the Kentucky campaign with Kirby Smith and uh, Bull Nelson. So we're going to be, you know, following in their footsteps. And then we've got some interesting stuff planned for next year, too. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to try to do one uh, in the spring where we have somebody guide us and then do one kind of late summer, early fall, where Daryl and I do the, the leading. So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of what we've been doing there. So Daryl, is there anything you want to add to that? Oh, I, yeah, first of all, I, you know, he's he's a pretty humble guy. Uh, and and uh, he, he's been doing this Kentucky and the Civil War blog uh, for, for a period of time. And he made, he reached out and, you know, I was doing this Ohio Perryville blog, which I really don't even focus on really much anymore because I'm, I'm more focused on the Western Theater blog. But he reached out and made some comments, I think, at one particular point And was like, oh, okay. Um, and then, you know, I went over and looked at the Kentucky Civil War blog. I'm like, oh, man, this guy's researching. Like, he is deep diving. He's got his first person accounts. He's got all this stuff. I mean, like. It, and it's a nice looking, nice looking website. It's like, oh, all right, this looks good. And then yeah, probably a couple months later, whenever it was, he, that's when he reached out. And I, I think part of it is because I'm fairly active on Facebook and, and, and try to drive a few different things on Facebook. Um, and it, it's been a pleasure. It has been a real pleasure. We've probably had, what, a dozen or 15 different historians and, and buffs right on the blog so far. Yeah. Um, we, we are at close to 100 blog posts in a year, I think, something I like that. We're, I know we're over 75. And like you alluded to, we have more in the pipeline. Um, we're looking forward to the Richmond tour. Um, uh, it's July 30th and July 31st. We're starting at Cumberland Gap, so we're going to we're going to explore Cumberland Gap a little bit. We'll follow uh, the Confederates as a well part of the Confederates as they move north, and then on the 31st is all day the Battle of Richmond, Kentucky. Um, ironically, fought the same day as um, Second Bull Run, so people forget about that connection. And um, probably the most complete Confederate victory of the Civil War, um, short of maybe Harper's Ferry surrender, um, is is the most complete Civil War um, Confederate victory. So it's um, it, it's been interesting. It's been fun. Uh, give a shout out to our good friends at the Hart County uh, Historical Society for hosting us at Mumfordville. They rolled out the red carpet. Oh, our yeah. wonderful friends, including Taylor Bishop over at and Betty Gore, and can't forget her. Uh, at uh, at Ted's Bend, they rolled out the red carpet. We had a, just a wonderful day back in April. I think those who attended, most of whom had not been to either one of the sites, were impressed with both sites. Uh, those are both pretty much local efforts and uh, well worth support. And so um, we're going to keep trying to do those kinds of things just to bring people in the West more together and do a little more study. Um, and I think we're excited also, you know, if, if we've got some other historians and buffs that are out there who are interested in writing, there's a form on the on the blog, they can fill out and Derek will vet them out and I'll tell Derek yes or no, or he'll ask me and I'll say, I don't know who that person is. No, I'm kidding. 
Um, but we'll, we, we love to get even more variety going uh, as much as possible um, and, and just bring all kinds of different stories. And I would be remiss if I did not mention Cass Cobb, who has been one of our most prolific blog posters. She's a, 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 a well-researched young lady uh, from, I want to say Owensboro, but I'm not really sure if that's 100% right. She's, well, close. she's from, from it. Yeah, she's, she's pretty close down in. Close. Uh, yeah, yeah, a few counties away, but yeah. Okay, gotcha. So she's been wonderful. She's bringing some different types of uh, uh, blogs uh, that I wouldn't thought of doing, right, myself, no way, um, that she's bringing those to light. So it's been, it, there's a there's a real mix of blog entries on that. Um, there's some simple stuff. I do simple to medium. Uh, I don't do deep, deep dives. Uh, I do obscure stuff. Uh, we have lighter pieces. We have really in-depth things. Um, uh, on the on the blog and we've had some wonderful writers along the way as well to support so it's been it's been a great experience so far right and i just want to piggyback off that a little bit you know with like writers like Cass, when we have uh you know taylor bishop too you know he's getting ready to go into college uh, we you know I, i'm a middle school teacher and so you know you always hear people say you know, youngsters today they, they don't care about the civil war that they will and they do if you are able to get them involved with it and you're able to get them hooked and if we can you know get these you know, like you know Cass and Taylor they've already they've both put out several posts for us and uh you know this is an opportunity for them to really start in that research process and that writing process that is critical for you know historians and you know go and get their foot in the door uh you know hopefully get them exposed to some uh, other people that might be able to help them out on the way and you know, this is something where, you know, we want to be able to show that young people do want to get involved in the Civil War, and they can. And so we're, you know, we're, we're trying to show, you know, this is example A, uh, Cass Cobb and Taylor Bishop right here. They, they are showing everybody that young people do care about the Civil War still. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It's a, Fantastic. Uh, I wanted to get on the high horse there. We, as older, me, me and my group and older, we have to stop doing things the same way. We have to start learning how to reach out to people and stoke their interest in a way they want to be stoked. Cass is all of what, 20, 21 years old? Yeah, she's and Taylor, college. I think, is 17 or 18. So don't, don't tell me it's not out there. We just have to make sure that we, as the older generation of historians and buffs, are uh, encouraging them in the ways that they feel comfortable that excites them and keeps their passion going. Fantastic. Fantastic. And hopefully uh, you can tell them about the Untold uh, Civil War podcast so they can come on this side, too. For sure. Uh, I bet both of them would love to. (laughs) (laughs) Well, before we cut out here, I want to thank you guys for coming on the podcast. It's been great. Um, You know, you're always welcome back. I'd love to have you guys back again. Um, Before we sign off, can you please just give us the shout out? What is the exact link to the uh, blog? Sure. Uh, so if you just check out westerntheatercivilwar.com, that'll take you to the website. And then uh, we don't have a Facebook page. We have a Facebook group because we, we want people to really participate on there. So uh, just look for Western Theater. Just type in Western Theater. You'll you'll find the group that's you know, pretty good size. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got several posts coming through a day on there from everybody. You know, me and me and Daryl, we, we don't really uh, we don't have to type up a lot of stuff on the group. We just click approve you know, on the posts and let the discussion flow from there. So yeah, check us out on there too. Um, you know, cause th- that's where a lot of the good conversation takes place is, is on the Facebook page and then you know, go to the site and the blog if you want some good stories and good information. Fantastic. And I will definitely put uh, links in the description. Um, before we sign out, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, the badge maker, the sponsor of this uh, show for all my reenactor buddies or um, anyone who wants to get a gift for their civil war buff in the family, definitely check out the badge maker, his wares, He's got the best uh, badge, uh, core badges, ID discs, Civil War pipes, you name it. Uh, he's even got a whole thing on custom projects if you want. So I'm sure he can uh, find some custom projects that involve the Western theater as well. So uh, great stuff. Thank you so much for coming on, guys. Um, I know you guys are busy, so thank you for making the time. Thank you so much. We're so uh, glad no to be on here. And thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you so much.